Well, it's great to be with you today. If you look around, you say, where in the world is everybody today? Well, we're here, and amen to that. Um, as Mike would share, and I'm sure you saw on the smile, one of our children did test positive, and so a lot of our young families, in abundance of caution, are staying home today. And I can certainly appreciate that. I want people to be able to do what they need to do, and I want us to remember that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, so we want to take care of ourselves the very best way we can. And we also have a number of people who are, have been together because there's been a funeral of the Huff and the Peterson family, which there's a large group of them. They all had a funeral yesterday for Mark's nephew who passed away very unexpectedly about a month ago. And then there's been all the spring breakers. So boy, there's been a lot that's happened. And so we're here together and I'm so glad to see you. And let me share with you that I'm very grateful that you prayed for me last week. It had been a long time since I drove 700 miles one way. Um, I found out that I'm not as young as I used to be. And I found out all kinds of things. I did the first 150 and went stopped in Baltimore on Sunday night and thought, oh, I can do this. And then the next day when I got in the car and I realized that I had to do more than three times what I had done the day before, I thought, maybe I can't. But I did. And I'm glad that I did. And I appreciate your prayers. I was with um, my mentor. And I was with the man who built into my life more than 40 years ago, but I will never forget him. And let me just tell you just one little clip. I'm processing tons of things that we did together because we spent every day together. I was there on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday through Thursday afternoon. And I went to see my younger sister a little bit further up in Knoxville and then came, came home. But as we spent some time together and we were outside, and his losing his hearing very rapidly. He's losing his sight very rapidly. He's got some things going on with his breathing and also some things going on with his heart. There's just so many things happening to him. And we'd get up early in the morning, we'd have breakfast, and then we'd sit out in the backyard, or we'd sit out in the front yard, and we just would share. And then later in the day, he'd get a rest, he'd take a nap for a while, and that gave me the opportunity to do some things that I thought were helpful to do. I went to my college, which I graduated a million years from before, and took a few pictures to show the grandchildren that there really was life in G-Daddy before they knew him, and before he, was a, before he even met me mommy, for that yeah. matter, and took some pictures. And then I went back to my very first church. The place was where I was ordained. And I recognized that I knew more people who were buried there than the people who were there now, I'm sure. Yeah. It had been such a long time. And then I went back and rejoined my friend RJ and we went to the woods. The same woods which he walked with me. The same woods which, when I was at a tough time in my life, he talked with me and shared with me from the heart lessons that I needed to hear. And we just thought about so many different things, we talked about so many different things, and we laughed, and we, we dreamed, and we reminisced, and it was just a very, very rich time. In fact, I'm very grateful, even though it was such a long ride back, that I had some time to really ponder all that had taken place. And I'll share more with you, as the Lord puts it on my heart to, to share with you. But I'll tell you one thing that I really was encouraged by, is we're sitting out there in this backyard, and you can't do it nearly as much as what he used to be able to do. And he, in his phone rang. And he has a flip phone, so it reminds me of my dad. He has a flip phone. Neither one of them want to get a smartphone. They want to have a dumb phone instead. So. And he said to me, i gotta make, got to make sure I answer this, because you just don't ever know if somebody might need me. And I thought to myself when he said that, no wonder you're my mentor. No wonder you're the man who planted in me so deeply, and I'm so appreciative of it. And so... There's going to be things that happen in this world that we don't understand. There's going to be some times that we go through some stuff that we would have never thought would come our way. I was listening to David Jeremiah today and he said, what happens when the ifs become why me? And I thought, what a great line because there's a lot of truth in that, right? But who's with us all the time? Jesus is with us all the time. And you hear me say all the time that he is stronger than anyone or anything we ever face and there's no doubt about that. Today, look around, more than three-fourths of us aren't even here. But Jesus is here, and that's what matters. And he wants us to look inside our hearts, not just so we focus on things that are happening on the outside. Jesus is here. So we're going to be starting a new study today, the book of Mark. And I want to go to the book of Mark, but we're going to be in a couple of other places too. So you might want to go to Mark chapter 1, but be prepared to go some other spots because you know they always have to visit a lot of places as we go. But we're going to be talking about this over and over and again. It's all about Jesus. Everybody wants to make it to be about something else right now. 
So they want to make it be about the pandemic, they want to make it be about the economy, they want to make it be about um, what's happening in the world, what's happening in our nation, what's happening in the city, what's happening in so many different places. So let me tell you, if you want to live the best life, keep the focus on the main thing. Get the right button, button then to the right place, and then everything else will line up. If you take the bottom button and you put it on the top of your shirt, everything's messed up, everything is all about Jesus. And when we understand that, and we live by that mandate, wow, our life has order, our life has purpose, we have peace that passes understanding, and we're so much apt, much more apt to live well, live wisely, and live with joy. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're with us. We pray that you'd be with all those, the Lord, who are away from us today. We know that uh, that's not an easy thing. That we're all weary of dealing with some of these things. So we know that some are going through times of grieving, too, and just spending time with their family, and some are traveling. Father, we thank you that you're able to be across the world. And Father, we're thankful that you're here right now. And Father, you've given us a lot of special gifts, but may we never forget the greatest gift you've ever given us is your Son, Jesus Christ. And he willingly came here, not just for everyone else, but he really came here for us. Father, we are so, um, we find ourselves so many times detoured in our thoughts. We're thinking about so many things, and thoughts just come through our mind a million times, and most of these thoughts are not from you. And a few of these thoughts are really centered on you. Father, may we, Lord, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and recognize that when we do that, everything else we need will be added to us. May we recognize that the one who is with us is stronger than anyone or anything we ever face. May we recognize that you have a purpose and plan for us that you want us to put into action. May we seek to know Jesus Christ more and more and more and grow in him through the years. May we know more about Jesus than we know about anyone else. And may we seek to follow him like we follow no one else. Thank you, Lord, for being with us today. And we pray, Lord, now that you would open up our hearts, if you open up our, your word, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, I'm so glad to be here, and I truly missed you. There's no doubt about that. I felt very strange when I was not here last Sunday, but certainly I was thinking about everybody and praying about everybody, and I'm grateful that Jim did such a good job. I watched him. We're trying to tape some things now so people who are home can have a little bit more experience and see more than just me, which I think is really good. And I have to tell you that it relieves me not to be sitting in my chair in my living room trying to see the camera because the first time that I taped it, Stephanie said to me, you're looking on the wrong side. The camera's on this side. And I thought, oh, that's good. I'm really good at all this. Sat in my prayer chair and tried my best, but boy, I'd much rather preach to people than I would pews, and there's no doubt about that. But every single time we gather together in the name of the Lord, I want you to know that it fills my heart with joy. It fills my heart with joy when we come together and we see each other and we smile. It fills my heart with joy when we pray together and when we sing together. It fills my heart when we just spend time just getting to know God better and to get to know each other together. But I am especially blessed when we make the choice to make a verse by verse journey through God's word. That to me is the main thing that I want us to do when we're together because I want us to know the full counsel of God. It's my hope and it's my prayer that we desire to know more about the scriptures than we know about any other thing. Now some people may wonder, and I've had some people ask me about this, why is it in heaven where that we don't share more topical sermons, especially in such a different and a difficult time? But truth be told, let me tell you what's going on in my heart. I'm tempted at times just to try to find a multiple ways to be able to talk about how to give a word of encouragement, how to overcome fear, how to overcome frustration. And I believe the topical messages can be very helpful, and I believe they can be very much given from God. But more often than not, that's the thing that the Lord has put in my heart to share in between books when I try to see what God has to me to say more as a pastor as I look around in the world in which we live. But I want us to know God's word. So as I prayed over and over and over again on where we should go, after doing 1 Peter and 2 Peter, after doing Job and so many other books, you know, as I prayed, the Lord said to me, here's what I want you to do. I want you to study and begin a study on the book of Mark. Now, I am well aware that it's going to take a little bit of time to get through 16 chapters. Like you, if you've been with us for a while, you know Matthew it was quite a ride. We were in Matthew for quite a while. Mark is a young man. He speaks about things more quickly than what Matthew did. Mark is a young man who talks more about what Jesus did than all the different things he said. I know it will take some time to be able to make their way through this particular book, but let me ask you a question. In these challenging times, what's the best thing we can do? Know more about Jesus Christ. 
There's no greater source of hope for us than what we can cling to and discover by examining the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. As we begin, let me give some background uh, information to this book, The Gospel of Mark. The author, obviously named Mark, but it's not simply named Mark, it's John Mark. John was his Hebrew name and Mark was his Roman name. In Acts chapter 12, we read a little bit about him. We know that he was in a very wealthy family, and his mother, she was a wealthy person. She probably had a very large home. She opened up her home so that people could come together in her home to gather together on the Lord's Day to do the Word together. One of Mark's closest friends in the world was the Apostle Peter. He just loved him. He was his mentor. He was someone who built into his life a lot. And when you read 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, you see that Mark didn't just love Peter. Peter loved Mark because how does he refer to him in that particular passage? He calls him his son. Now, most scholars, if you were to look up the book of Mark, you would see that they would say that the primary source for this book that we're reading is Peter because you have to be an apostle or a direct convert of an apostle to be able to have your book put in the canon of the scripture. So they say the primary source for this gospel is Peter, but Peter was not the only dedicated person who was in Mark's life. He had other Christian people who were in his life, and one of the people he was blessed to have in his life was a man by the name of Barnabas. If you've ever heard of Barnabas, you know that Barnabas had a nickname, and the nickname that he had was the Son of Encouragement. He's a relative of Mark. He was either a cousin or an uncle. We're not sure about that, but he certainly was a good example to have in his life. Barnabas, let's speak about him just for a little while. He's mentioned 23 times in the book of Acts and five times in the letters of Paul. When we read about, well, the way he chose to live his life, we can certainly see why he got the nickname, Son of Encouragement. The first time we read about Barnabas in the scripture, what do we see? Well, we see in Acts chapter 4, verse 37, that he had a field. And he worked that field. And when he worked that field, here's what he did. When he got the processes from the fields, he sold the field. And then after selling the field, he gave all the apostles the proceeds that he gained from that particular field. In Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 31, we see that after Paul became a Christian and had a dramatic conversion, Barnabas went to Jerusalem and he vouched for him because the people in Jerusalem were a little nervous about this guy who had been a persecutor of the church and he wanted to make sure that he was there with Paul and encouraging Paul at such a crucial time in his life. In Acts chapter 11 verse 22 it talks about the time that in Jerusalem that all kinds of people were coming to the Lord and when all these people were coming to the Lord here's what the church did. They said go get Barnabas because we want to make sure that he's here so he can work with these people who are new believers. What happened next? Well, we see in Acts chapter 23, excuse me, in Acts chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, that when Barnabas arrived, he saw the evidence of God's grace, and he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Not just with some of their hearts, but with all their hearts. And then it tells us about Barnabas a little bit more thoroughly when it says, he, Barnabas, was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Talk about being a dedicated person. Talk about making a difference in the kingdom of God. However, it didn't stop there. Barnabas did a lot of things, but he didn't make the past be the hallmark of his life. What did he do? He went on to make the rest of his days be the best of his days. And I want you to see just a couple things about what he did that illustrate that important truth. Before we get to Mark, go with me, if you will, to the book of Acts, chapter 11. Acts, chapter 11. I want to see a little bit more about this guy who was such an influencer in Mark's life. In Acts, chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, we read these words. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Now, who's Saul? Saul is Paul. He said that his name changed yet. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a full year, Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. If you're not familiar with that, it used to be called the Way. And then it became Christians later on after that. And the ministry of uh, Barnabas didn't stop there. Skip down just a little bit more to chapter 13 of the book of Acts and look at Verses 1 through 3, because it tells us, well, he's praying together with Barnabas, and they're fasting together, and they're worshiping God together. Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, received a call from the Holy Spirit to go on their first missionary journey to Asia Minor, or what is Turkey, and they invited Mark, the very writer of this gospel, to come along with them. Now, there's a lot of practical lessons that I see in these particular sets of verses that I feel like we need to talk about, and the first is this. 
It's good to be around solid Christian people. Sometimes you just say, wow, I felt so beaten down. And then I, I was around a person who had taste twice seriously. And all of a sudden, I'm on fire a little bit more. All of a sudden, I'm settled a little bit more. All of a sudden, I want to move forward a little bit more. I'm a little bit more bored. It is so important to be around solid Christian people. What do we do for each other? We encourage each other. We strengthen each other. And we need each other. There's no doubt about that. When we come apart from other people, what tends to happen? We start to come apart ourselves. Haven't we seen that? When we weren't together for a long period of time, all of a sudden we find ourselves drifting. And we weren't drifting up. We were drifting down. We weren't drifting forward. We were drifting backward. It's so important that we find ourselves around solid Christian people. But that's not the only thing I see in this particular passage. Not only is it important to be around solid Christian people, it's important to be a solid Christian ourselves. Because other people need things from us. Well, how do we do that? Well, Barnabas, life is, answers that question because not only what did we see about him as we looked, we saw that he spent time in prayer. He spent time fasting and worshiping God. He made the best days of his life not be the days that he already lived, but the days that were ahead. If you read on about Barnabas, what do you see? He gave his time, he gave his talent, and he gave his treasure to all who were in need. And he saw value in new believers and built into them regardless of their past. And aren't you glad? All of us have things in our past that we're not proud of. All of us have things in our past that we wish never took place. All of us are grateful for a holy whiteout. And Barnabas was a person who built in the people regardless of their past. That's no wonder. The Bible, when speaking of him, says he was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Barnabas was ready. He was willing to do whatever the Lord wanted him to be and do, and he encouraged other people to make the same choice. No wonder he was given the nickname, the son of encouragement. So Mark must have been really excited when Barnabas comes up to him and he's got Paul beside him, and they say, we're getting ready to go on a missionary journey, and the one we want to take on this missionary journey is you. We want you to serve with us on our very first missionary journey. Well, who wouldn't want to go with them? Yet, and it's powerful yet, being a missionary isn't always easy. Let me show you that there's far more to being a Christian leader than what people tend to see on the surface. And that was especially true for Mark on this particular trip. I want you to see what happened. Move over again to Acts. And in Acts chapter 13, look at verse 5. Mark, the Bible tells us, was with them in the NIV, it says, as their helper. In other translations of the Bible, you'll see that in chapter 13, verse 5, it says that he was their servant. Some translations say minister. The term translated helper, servant, or minister comes from the Greek word huperites, which literally means under rower. We hear that again? He was their under rower. And that term means all that it implies. Well, others were on the deck on this particular cruise ship and joined the cruise. Where was Mark on this particular journey? He was down below working as an under rower. It was his responsibility to keep the ship on the move by rowing hour after hour, day after day, week after week. And there's a lesson in that system. And let me show you what that lesson is. Ministry isn't always easy. It isn't always just miles and miles of smiles and smiles. A lot of ministry is done behind the scenes in absolute obscurity. Much of ministry is hard, and at times it's harsh. Ministry requires some things. Ministry requires commitment. It requires sacrifice. And it also requires surrender and perseverance. Mark had to learn that lesson, and he learned it the hard way. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly what took place, but it does let us know that for whatever reason, Mark was fed up with this job. He didn't care whether Barnabas was with him. He didn't care what had happened with Barnabas. He didn't care whether Paul was with him either. What did he decide to do? He decided to get off this ship, turn around, and go back home. Wow. Now, sometime later, what takes place? Barnabas and Paul are meeting again. They say, hey, we did a great job on our first missionary journey. Let's go out on another missionary journey. And Barnabas says, oh, I'd love to do that. But here's what I want to do. I want to bring my, my relative Mark with us. And when Paul hears that, he is just adamantly opposed to it because of what had taken place the time before. And before long, what started to happen in the kingdom of God? All of a sudden, the relationships become so strange that they parted ways. 
at this particular point, what takes place? Well, Paul, he teams up with Silas, and Barnabas, he teams up with Mark. And there's a lesson in that too. Because when I think about what happened, I'm reminded about a verse that all of us have known for years. And that verse is what? It's Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which says, And we know in all things, not for all things, but in all things, God works for the good for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Now, so many people cite this verse in so many different ways. Let's make sure we understand what this verse is actually teaching. This verse does not tell us that everything that happens in this world is good. Because not everything that happens in this world is good. This verse does not tell us that everything that happens is the will of God. Because a lot of things in this world that happen are not the will of God. It tells us that God is so powerful, he can bring good out of all things, even things that aren't good things. That's his will. But there's a qualifier for that to take place. What does this verse teach about the qualifier? He does these things for those who love him. He does these things for those who choose to fulfill his purpose. And let me give you a good word about Mark. That's what happened in this situation. Because not only did the two teams now cover more ground and reach more people, what do we know about Mark, the author of this particular book? We know that he repented. We know that he grew. We know that he matured. And then he went on. We can trace him a little bit. Who did he help in the future? He helped a name, man by the name of Philemon. There's a book in the Bible called Philippians. He helped a man whose name, whose name that book is named after. And after that, the Apostle Paul, he wrote a letter to the church at Colossae. And he, that's the book of Colossians. And he says, let me tell you, this man can come and he can help you. But the good news didn't stop there. When Paul knew that his days were coming toward an end, and were coming to an end very rapidly, he wrote a letter to young Timothy, young Pastor Timothy, and listen to what he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. He says, get Mark. This is the very Mark who had abandoned them earlier, and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Not only was Mark helpful to Barnabas, Philemon, and those in the church of Colossae, he was helpful to Paul in his ministry. Clearly, what happened? Mark got to a better place, but he wasn't the only one who got to a better place. Who else got to a better place? The Apostle Paul. What a powerful reminder that we do not have to be defined by our worst moment. Aren't you glad? We don't have to look over our shoulders for the rest of our life just because some things have happened in our life that we wish hadn't happened. We don't have to attach some scarlet letter and put it over top of our heart and let everyone see it and identify us with God that for the rest of our lives. What can happen in our life because of Jesus? We can be forgiven, our chains can be broken, and we can be set free. Jesus can bring about something good even from something that isn't. That's what happened to Paul, that's what happened to Mark, and it can happen for you, and it can happen for me. It's the reason why we continually talk about when we're studying the book of Peter, it's not so much what happens in us that matters, excuse me, it's not so much what happens to us that matters, it's what happens in us that matters. We can't make the choice as what's going to come our way, but we do have the responsibility and the choice to respond how we're going to respond to these things, and through the power of the Lord, we can grow and overcome. Well, how much did Mark grow? Well, he grew so much that when the Holy Spirit was looking for someone to write a letter, he said, I'm going to use Mark. Talk about redeeming your pain. Talk about the value of not looking backward, but looking forward. Mark, the one who struggled so much that he got off the ship, didn't care what anybody said, I'm getting off this ship. He turned around and went home. But later on, he was used of God, and he made an impact in the Lord's name, not only for the time he was here on this earth, but thousands of years later, we are able to benefit from the book he penned, which we have in our hand. Let me show you. Scholars tell us that this is the very first gospel that was written. It's also the shortest account that's written, and it moves at the quickest pace. There's no doubt about that. You're going to see a word in Mark, depending on your translation, a number of times, and the word you're going to see is the word immediately. It shows up 59 times in the New Testament. 58 of those times are in the Gospels, and one time's in the book of Acts. But Mark himself, when he's speaking, uses the word immediately 41 times in his Gospel alone. That tells me he was anxious to share he couldn't wait to talk about Jesus. He wanted every opportunity he could to talk about Jesus. 
So let's begin the same way that Mark began. Let's begin at full force. Interestingly, Mark wasn't led of the Spirit to share about the Lord's pre-existence. He wasn't led to talk about his birth. He was led to talk about the forerunner who would come his way, John. John the Baptist, the one who God the Father sent to prepare for his coming. So let's look and see what we can gain by looking at the first few passages and the first few verses in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, where we read these words. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who is used to you, it's the promised Messiah, who will prepare your your way, Christ's way, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for who? Prepare your way for the Lord and make straight paths for him. Now, how did Mark begin this particular book? He began this book by centering on the one he's going to be talking about throughout this journey. And who is that? Jesus Christ. And when he talked about it, he's not just saying he's a popular person. He's not just saying he's a famous person. He's not just saying he's a prophet or he's a priest. Who's he saying? He says he's the Lord. He's the Son of God. Right from the start, what does he do? He quotes some prophets. He quotes Malachi and he quotes Isaiah. In, chapter, in verse 2, he quotes Malachi 3.1, which says, See, I send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And after that, in verse 3, he quotes Isaiah 43, which says, A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. May straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Both of these Old Testament prophecies were declared centuries before. Obviously, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, is the main theme of this book. And but what's the Lord telling us? He's saying that Jesus is so important I am sending someone before him who will prepare the way. Back in those days, if you had a king who was coming, you prepared the road. Back in those days, if you had a king who was coming, you had a messenger to come and let everybody know that a king is coming. Now the king of kings is coming. But when were these prophecies shared? They were shared centuries before. If you read Malachi, you recognize it was 450 years before Jesus came that these words were proclaimed. And if you read the book of Isaiah, you'll see there was 750 years before these Jesus Christ was proclaimed. But during that time, God had not forgotten much else. He ignored his promises. The Father fulfilled his promise and sent Jesus into the world. He came just as the prophecies had been declared by Malachi and Isaiah, and he brought a forerunner who prepared the way. God is a God of order, and when he speaks, he speaks truth, and every single time he makes a promise, you can depend on the fact that it will come true. Well, what happened next? Look at me at Mark chapter 1, verse 4. And so John, this is not John the Apostle, this is John the Baptist, John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Wow, John came preaching. John the Baptist came preaching. We know he was sort of unusually dressed. We know he had some unusual mannerisms. We know he ate some very unusual food. But why is it that people wanted to come near him? What kind of things did he say? How did he gather people to him? Keep your place in the place you put your finger in the place in Mark, but go with me to Luke just for a minute. Luke chapter 3. And let's look at just a few words that he said when he was preaching. Luke chapter 3. Look at verses 7 through 9. It says, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, snakes. Now, how would you like it if I'm not get up here? So we got a word for you, you vipers. I got a word for you, you snakes. Who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our fathers. Don't say we're just religious people who come from religious families. For I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. The axe or judgment is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Well, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I think, so no, I just don't think this guy would be on TV today. Yeah. <laughs> I don't hear too much preaching like this anymore and I don't think you do either. But how did the people respond to this message that John was giving? We go back to Mark. And when we go back to Mark, let's go back to chapter 1 and look at verse 5. Where we're told, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. 
Now, I want us to read the Bible for ourselves. So many people tell us so many things about Jesus that just aren't true. So let's make sure we see exactly what's being taught. Do you notice what I do in this particular passage? The thing that I notice is this. John didn't go to the people. The people went to John. And what did they do when they met up with him? They confessed their sins and they were baptized. Very important word. They were baptized in the Jordan River. Now, let those words sink in. The people from Jerusalem and Judea went to John. What does that mean? That means they left the comfort of living in the cities and they went to the desert because they not only wanted to see him, they wanted to hear for themselves what this man proclaimed that so many people were talking about. They were curious enough to travel. And when they heard him, what were they listening for? They were very attentive to his words. And how did they respond? They confessed their sins. What does it mean to confess your sins? It means they said the very same things about their sins that God says about their sins. And after saying that, what did they do? They repented. They went the other direction. And then after confessing their sins and repenting, they were baptized. Now, don't misunderstand what this passage is telling us. This verse is not telling us that our sins are forgiven when we are baptized. I have a lot of friends who look at this differently. And there's a lot of denominations that look at this differently, but let's just take a look at what the scripture has to say for itself. John's message and his encouragement was a baptism not to obtain salvation, but as an outward sign of what had already happened in the heart when a person made the decision to repent. When they made the decision to say, yes, I have sinned. But I'm going to stop sinning, or at least I'm going to strive to stop sinning, and I'm going to turn around and I'm going to go the different direction. And hear my heart. And far more important to hear biblical truth. Our sins cannot be forgiven by anything we can do at all. Hear that again? Our sins cannot be forgiven by anything we can do at all. When I think about that, I think about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9, which talks about how salvation is a gift of God, not of works, lest any person should boast. That's a verse that speaks to me, but there's another verse that speaks to me that I want you to see. Look with me in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, where Paul writes these words. He says, in him, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Salvation is a gift of God. Therefore, and it's a big therefore, our sins can only be forgiven by what? By the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that he made for us when he was on the cross. We cannot inherit forgiveness of our sins from our ancestors. We cannot earn it by doing good things. Forgiveness is only possible because of what Christ did for us on the cross. So let me share with you what takes place when a person is baptized. Maybe you've been baptized and you remember it. Maybe you've never seen somebody be baptized or at least be baptized by immersion and you wonder what takes place. Let me tell you what I do when I'm with people who are being baptized. I publicly ask them a question in front of all their friends and in front of all their families. Have you had a time, have you had a place where you asked Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to come into your heart as your personal Lord and your personal Savior? Have you truly met Jesus Christ? And when that person says yes, I then put my arm around them I tell them to hold on to their nose because they're not about to go backwards. There's no doubt about that. And then I say, I say these words. I said, therefore, in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And at that particular point, here's what takes place. I plunge them under the water, and then I start to bring them up. And as I bring them up, I say these words, buried with him in baptism, but raised to walk in newness of God life because that's the calling to walk in newness of life the old you is gone it's dead it's buried and you've been raised to walk in newness of life baptism is an outward expression of an inner reality it signifies what takes place in a person's heart at the moment of their salvation it's a symbol of a person choosing to die to self rise to walk in newness of life and following christ Baptism gives us a wonderful opportunity to take a public stand for Jesus and encourages other people to do the same. It's so precious. It's so important. It's the first step of obedience after asking Jesus into our heart and experiencing salvation. And if you have never been baptized or you want to talk more about it, 
please let's get together and let's share because it's such an important thing to do, to be baptized. But in the time of John the Baptist, when we're reading right now, Jesus had not yet been revealed to the world, so baptism was what? It was a public declaration that affirmed the need to be prepared for the coming Messiah. That's why when John was baptizing people, what did they do? They confessed their sins and repented of them. It was a witness of the truth we all know about, but we don't talk about nearly as much as what we should. We cannot get forgiveness on our own. We can't obtain forgiveness on our own. When a person was being baptized by John, they were saying in essence to everyone who was there, I have sinned. I cannot earn forgiveness on my own, much less get it from a friend or family member. I know, let's be specific, I know I've said some things that were the wrong things. I know I saw some things that were the wrong things. I know I've done some things that were the wrong things. I know there have been times in my life when I've done the right things, but I've done them for the wrong reason. I know I am what? I know I am a sinner who needs a Savior. Now Mark understood this truth, and he wanted to make sure that his readers did as well. We are not baptized to be forgiven. We are baptized because we have been forgiven after confessing our sins and repenting of our sins and asking Jesus Christ to be our personal Lord and our personal Savior. Preaching repentance, man, it's not a popular topic. Mm -hmm. But what does Mark tell us? Mark tells us that people came from all over Jerusalem and Judea in the wilderness to hear John. And there's a lesson in that too. Let me tell you what it is. If a person really wants to come to Jesus and grow in him, they have to be willing to step away from their own life. Amen. Don't hear too much preaching about that these days either. So let me share with you again. If a person really wants to come to Jesus and grow in Jesus, they have to be willing to walk away from their old life. They have to be choose, choose to be different from those who are in the world, and they have to choose to follow Christ and let him be the loudest voice. When John was preaching, what did he do? He preached hard truth. But what happened? The people responded to it. And why did they do that? It's because he was a real charismatic personality. Was he somebody who just said things so well that everybody wanted to do it? No, that wasn't the reason. Was it because he was a real handsome man? Well, we don't know much about what he looked like besides the things he wore. But I don't think it was that. It certainly wasn't because he was stylish. Because look how he's described in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 6. It says, John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locust and wild honey. So why was it that people responded to John's message? I'll tell you why. They knew his message was true. They recognized that the message he shared told them that they had a need they could not fill on their own. And when they saw him preaching and heard what he said, let me tell you what they, what they recognized, and it's a refreshing thing. Instead of pointing to himself, what did he do? He pointed to Jesus. Wouldn't all of our lives be so much better if instead of pointing to ourselves or pointing to any other human person, we pointed to Jesus? Look how verse 7 and verse 8 illustrate that. It tells us, and this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to try to picture in your mind what the people who are there were thinking when they're seeing this. They're hearing, what? Someone's coming here that's mightier than John the Baptist? Haven't you heard people are coming from all over Jerusalem and Judea to them? Don't you know that John's having people who are leaving the city and coming out to the middle of nowhere? Don't you know all these different people are being baptized? How could anyone be mightier than John? How could that possibly be? Yeah, he's got a big reputation. He's widely known. But people came from far and wide to see him and hear him. There's no doubt about that. How could anyone come that's mightier than John? But Mark answers that question, and I'll tell you what he says. He says, because John baptized people in the waters of, Jan of, the, of the waters of Jordan. But when Jesus baptized people, he baptized them with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, you know what? Sometimes people get things really mixed up. And if we're not really careful, sometimes we put the emphasis on the wrong thing, or especially on the wrong person. Let me give you a little bit of a segue before we go deeper into John. John understood, and he celebrated the Lord's coming. But let me tell you what happened. Some of his followers, he had disciples himself. They didn't. They weren't really thrilled that people were leaving John and going to Jesus. And history tells us that as Jesus' ministry grew, what started to happen to John's ministry started to diminish. And what happened as a result? Well, keep your finger in Mark, but go with me to the Gospel of John. I not you see something that shows human nature, even in godly people? John, chapter 3, verse 25 through 30. It says, they, now this is some of John's helpers, came to John 
And they said to him, Rabbi, that man, they knew his name. They knew his name. They knew his name was Jesus. That man who was with you, I want to make sure you know what we're talking about, who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one, you know the one, who testified, well, he's baptizing, and what do they say after that? And everyone is going to him. He's trying to desert John. When we try to do things in the name of the Lord, a lot of times people try to divert us. Even some of the people who we are closest to, even some of the people we're working with. Why does John respond? Listen to how the verse continues to this. John replied, A man can only receive what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend belongs to the one who attends. The bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. Now look at this next line. This next line is one of the most powerful lines in all of Scripture. He must become greater and I must become less. There's a lesson in that too, isn't there? It's all about Jesus. It always has been and it always will be all about Jesus. Amen. What does that mean? That means Amen. we need to look to Jesus above everyone else. We need, to, we need to invite his voice to be the loudest, the one we hear. We need to follow him. And we do well to pray what we saw John say. He must become greater and I must become less. So picture what's going on. All these people have been coming to John. It's really popular. His disciples are upset. They're not coming to Jesus at first, but they start coming to Jesus, and all kinds of people get uptight about that. Well, what takes place next? Look back with me at Mark chapter 1, verse 9, where we read, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. If you're a student of Scripture, you know that John was real reluctant to baptize Jesus. He said, you need to baptize me. Why are you asking me to baptize you? And Jesus said, it's right to do this because he wanted to identify with the people and be their example. Talk about love. Talk about a gift. Look what happens next. Same chapter, chapter 1 of Mark, verse 10 and 11. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open, which just ripped open right in front of him, and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now let's think about what was taking place. Heaven opened wide when Jesus was being baptized. And the Spirit, the Spirit of God, descended on Jesus like a dove. Now when we think of dove, what do we think about? We think about it being a symbol of peace and humility. But in the Old Testament, let me tell you what it symbolized. A dove was identified as a sacrifice for a sin offering. What a vivid reminder that Jesus is the sacrifice for our sin and the only way to God. What a vivid reminder that if you want to please the Father, you come to Him through the Son. Yes, Jesus has come, and that changes everything. Jesus has come. But here's the question of the hour, and it's the one that matters throughout all of eternity. Has He come into your heart? Have you confessed your sins? Have you repented of your sins? And have you asked him to not only be your Savior, but the Lord of your life? And are you growing in him? There's a lot of practical lessons that I see in this passage. And I see a lot more than what I'm sharing with you, but let me share with you some of the ones that pop out to me and stand the strongest as I look at it. First thing we've seen is what? It's good to be around solid Christians. Have you noticed how different your week goes when you come together in the name of the Lord and meet with godly people? Amen. Have you noticed how different it is when you spend time talking to godly people and praying with godly people and encouraging each other? It's good to be around godly people. But what else do we know from this particular passage? It's good to be a godly person yourself because other people need you just like you need them. But that's not all we've seen in this particular passage. What else have we seen in this passage? We've seen that ministry isn't always easy. Sometimes things, we're going to do some things for God, it's just going to be really easy. There not going to be any challenges to it at all. Well, that's not true. It can be challenging. It can be a thing that takes commitment and sacrifice, and it can go deeper than that sometimes, because sometimes when you hear about the crowd, you have to be willing to surrender, and you have to be willing to do something that so many people in the world in which we live in don't want to do. Persevere. That's not all we've seen in this particular verse. What else have we seen? We've seen that God can work all things together for good for those who love Him and are faithful to their calling. And we've seen that when someone truly follows Jesus, they're changed. They're different. And they start to walk in newness of life.
But the most important lesson we've seen in this is this. Jesus is God. And that changes everything. Jesus is God. That changes everything. Don't wait until Christmas to say joy to the world. The, world, the Lord has come. As we study the book of Mark, we're going to learn more about the life of Jesus. We're going to learn more about the life of Jesus for ourselves. We're not just going to hear what other people have to say about it. We're going to look at the words and see what he did and see what he said. I am so grateful that he used Mark to write this particular gospel. Because Mark's a person who really grew and he understood the importance of sharing about Jesus. And this whole gospel is about Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's what it's always been about. And that's the lesson of all lessons we can gain from this passage. It's all about Jesus. We need how many times have we said to ourselves or to each other, I'm never going to do this again, and we did. How many times have we said to ourselves, I'm never going to say that again, and we said it. How many times have we said, we're never going to go there anymore, in our mind, in our heart, with our feet, and we did. Who do we need? We need the one who this is all about. We need Jesus. And the more we recognize we need him, the better off we'll be. Have you seen what I've seen in this last year? How many people are talking about Jesus? How many news reports are about Jesus? How many news reports share anything about what that Bible has to say? It shouldn't surprise us that message is silent. But it shouldn't be silent with us. So I asked the Lord, where do we go? We did First Peter. Where do we go? We did 2 Peter. Where do we go? Because there's a part of me that just wants to talk about how to be an overcomer, how to endure, how to persevere, and do topical sermons, which I think are helpful. The Lord said to me, yes, they are helpful, but that's not where I have for you now. Here's where I have for you. Center on Jesus. Because when people center on Jesus, see what he said and did, that changes their life. That's where we're heading. It's all about Jesus. And aren't you glad? Amen. Let's pray together. Amen. Father, we know that there's no one like Jesus. We know that no one else would leave the perfection of heaven and come to this sin scarred world rather than Jesus. We know that He willingly came. We know that you had Him say words that no one else has ever said words of light and life. We know, Lord, that He lived the perfect example for us. Oh, how we need to glean from his life. Oh, how we need to follow him and make him do the loudest for us. Father, we hear so many people talking about so many different things, and it's so easy to get diverted. Even when we read the Bible, to forget about Jesus. Sometimes we're so in love with Christianity, we forget about Jesus. Father, may we recenter today. May we remember that he came, and because he came, everything is different, and that part of everything is us. Father, we thank you, Lord, that Mark, a young man, didn't just say, I made a mistake, I can't go forward. He walked forward. And he's blessing us even now, thousands of years later. May we read the words he shared. May we understand the words he shared. May we live out the words he shared. May we have a life that says, Jesus is our Savior, Jesus is our Lord. May we have a life that says, we fully believe that everything is truly all about Jesus. Father, we thank you for your Son. We thank you for your heart for sending me. Thank you for his willingness to come. We thank you he's with us now. And we thank you someday we'll be with him forever. But we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.